Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw away from them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. An angel of heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, it must not have been fun if you were a disciple to be told by Jesus, why are you sleeping? Get up. Um, that happens to me all the time. We have a one-month-old at our house, and if my wife catches me sleeping, I'm in big trouble because I should be helping. Um, but that's how it is at my house. Today what I want to do is talk a little bit about the end of a series where we've called Into the Wilderness. Uh, you know, when we use the phrase wilderness, it's important to remember that in the Bible, wilderness was a scary place. For you and I, it's like a national park and a happy thing that we go to to enjoy nature. But in Old Testament and even in New Testament times, the wilderness was a scary place. It was a place where there were wolves and lions and danger and scorpions, and you had no safe place to rest your head. And often we think of wilderness as a bad thing. It's the place that you don't want to be, and that's true because it's not uh, safe. But one of the things that we've been trying to lift up here is whenever we find ourselves in a difficult season of life, when we find ourselves in the wilderness, the basic conviction is this is that God's in control of your life even while you're in the wilderness and that there is a purpose to your suffering. God's in control even in the midst of your suffering and there is a purpose to it. You know, if you're an atheist, one of the things that's very difficult is to explain the concept of suffering. Suffering is just what happens. It's the way things are. There's no purpose to it. And whenever you have a bad go of things, that's just the way it is and too bad for you. But as a Christian... In the Christian faith, one of the things we believe is that when bad things happen, it's not God's intent per se, but at the same time, God can use that for good. For example, when Moses went out of Egypt and he took all the Israelites with him through the Red Sea, they could have gone right up to the promised land, but instead, what did they do? They spent 40 years wandering around in the desert, and it wasn't an accident. God led them there. Why? So that he could shape them. So that he could teach them things that they needed to know. Elsewhere, we talked about the Israelites. We learned that, you know, at one time their homeland was destroyed and they were exiled off to Babylon. Why? It wasn't because God loves suffering. It's because God needed to teach them and us a lesson about the importance of keeping his commands, but also how even in the midst of our difficult times, God will ultimately restore us. We talked last week about Jesus' initial ministry, how it started with a time in the wilderness and in the desert. So right after he was baptized, what was the very next thing that happened to Jesus? He was cast out into the wilderness so that God could try to shape him and where he could pass different trials and temptations and come out on the other side. The preparation for his ministry was built in the wilderness. And the difficult times in my life and in your life are the times where God is going to use to shape us and to mold us into who he wants us to be. If he's going to do something great in your life, he's going to shape you and test you first so that when you get to that difficult place, you won't fall into temptation. Today what I want to do is talk about the final moments of Jesus' life where he found himself in the wilderness once again. He starts in the wilderness right before his ministry kicks off and he ends in a very wild place as well. It kind of is a bookend to Jesus' ministry career. The text that we just read today starts with Jesus in the Mount of Olives. And so this is kind of crazy, but you know, just a couple days before, he enters Jerusalem to singing and praise. And when he walked into the city, everyone thought, man, here's our Messiah. Here's our guy. This is the one we're going to elect president. This is the one we're going to give the keys to because he is the one we can trust and the one we want. And he comes in on a little donkey, a humble donkey, right? Um, usually if you were a military leader at the time, you would ride on on a big horse. But Jesus comes in very humbly. If you're a dictator today, what do you ride in? You ride on, on, on a tank or some kind of big, powerful weapon. And Jesus came in in the most humble, soft way that he possibly could. And even though crowds are cheering him on, the very next thing that happens is he starts to cry. He says, oh my goodness, these folks think that it's going to be like this, but it's actually going to be like this. And Jesus has a sense that things are going to be different and no one else understands it. And so it starts to get dark. 
Right before Jesus goes to the cross, there's this special moment where he's alone in the garden on the Mount of Olives, and it's a place you can go to. Um, it's not very far from where the Dome of the Rock is and the famous uh, vision uh, of Jerusalem that you normally see. You just go down a little valley and up the other side. There's some beautiful churches there and places where you can pray today. And this story starts where Jesus is going like for one last moment of peace before he goes to the cross. And he gets in the garden, and he starts praying, and he says, God, I need help. God, I don't want to do this. If this is possible, let this cup pass from me. But if it's your will, let your will be done and not mine. And today what I want to do is talk about just 10 moments. In the last few moments of Jesus' life, 10 little snapshots. Wait, snapshots. Snippets. Snipshots, right? <laughs> I just trademarked that. Snipshots. You know, all right. Snapshots of Jesus' last days where um, we see him in the wilderness in a very unique way. First one is this, is that he was alone in prayer. He was alone in prayer. You know, one of the things that uh, often happens here in Miami is you'll throw a party, and you'll tell people that the party starts at like 7 p.m. on a Friday night, and then there's this awkward moment, right, where it's like 7.15 and no one's there. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's 7.15, maybe 7.30, no one's there yet. 8 o'clock starts to come up, and then there's this awkward moment where you realize, what if no one comes to the party that I invited them to? What happens if nobody shows up? And then eventually you start getting texts, hey, I'm on my way, or I'm really sorry I can't make it tonight. Hey, this came up, there's no way we're going to make it. And can you imagine what it would be like if you had prepared your house for this huge party, and you expected all these people to come, and about an hour or two into it, you start getting texts from every single person that you invited saying that they can't make it, how would you feel? You'd feel abandoned by your friends, and you'd be alone in a very uh, lonely place. You know, Jesus invited all of his disciples to pray with him. He said, you guys sit here, and I'm going to sit here, and what we're going to do is we're going to pray, and I need your help. When I'm going to go into this very dark and difficult time in my life, I need my friends around me, and I need to know that you're with me. I need to know that when I take the football and I start running down the field that I've got blockers and I've got people that are going to be with me the whole way through. And instead, what ends up happening for Jesus, one of the first snapshots of loneliness that he faces, is he realizes that his disciples aren't going to be with him. Because when he asked them to pray, instead what he finds is that they went off to sleep. And they didn't quite understand, probably, the pain that he was going through. And so in one of Jesus' most lonely moments, he's with his own disciples, and they don't show up. He says, can't you guys stay awake? Can't you guys help? Is there anything you can do? And I think in Jesus' heart, there was like this little sinking moment where he realized that as he goes to the cross, his best friends weren't going to be with him, and they were going to leave him. Another tough moment that happens in this story is right after Jesus is done praying, one of his dearest friends betrays him. So Judas was one of the disciples, and we always think of Jesus, Judas as the one who betrays him, but you have to remember that for three years before that, Judas was one of his best friends. Judas ate dinner with him every night. Judas uh, hang out with him around the campfire and was a good friend and sang songs and walked next to Jesus all the time. There's no indication really leading up to the betrayal that Judas was the one who was going to do it. And so here's this crazy moment where after Jesus' disciples betray him, Judas comes forward with a band of enemies to arrest him. Dante, who was one of the most important medieval thinkers about heaven and hell, wrote a book called Inferno. I'm sure you've heard of it. Do you know that he has nine layers of hell in the Inferno? And the most bottom layer, the worst layer, is one that he called treachery, which was deserved for people who betrayed you. For people who betrayed you. Who on the one side looked like they were your best friends, but then in an instant showed up and were the opposite. Those are the people, Dante said, were the ones who, like, deserve the worst hell because they create the most pain. And here Jesus looks at a friend, and it even is interesting how Judas betrays him. It's with a kiss. Isn't it interesting that with a gentle, nice act of friendly uh, reception is the same act which betrays the Son of God. And so here Jesus sees his best friend betraying him. This last week, um, this is a, an interesting story where I just got a sense of this. Uh, I used to attend a church called Willow Creek before I came here when I wasn't at another church that I was working at. It's a wonderful church that I love. And just this week in the news, um, there was a, a story uh, published by the Chicago Tribune, and it was all over the news in the Christian world where their pastor was accused of sexual misconduct. And um, 
you know, and that's not an uncommon thing these days. And the church denies it, and they've done all their investigations and all the, so and so. And and that's a pretty normal process by which things happen. But then there was something that I read in the article that really struck me. And so here you have this famous pastor that has an accusation made against him. But what what really made me just take a step back was who the accusation came from. It was one of his other pastors and another one of his dearest friends and coworkers two of the highest level people that he worked with over decades at that church. Man, it's one thing when someone else makes an accusation against you, but when your closest friends are the ones doing it, that's tough. And so here you have Jesus, one of his dearest friends, saying, Jesus, I'm turning you in. We've been friends for a long time, and you and I have been tight, but moving forward, we're done. And I've had enough, and you're gone, and there's no hope for you anymore. And so here you get another snapshot of how lonely Jesus is becoming. A third one happens right after that. Peter disowns him. You know, Peter wasn't like Judas. Judas was one of his close friends, but Peter was his best friend. These were the kind of guys, you know, when you're getting married, who's standing next to you holding your rings. Peter was the friend who he could always count on. In fact, right before Jesus goes to the cross, they're having dinner together, and Jesus starts talking about how he might have to die and go to the cross. And Peter says, no, 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 no. You can't let that happen, Jesus. I don't want to lose you. And then Peter says something crazy. He says, wherever you go, I'm going to go. I'll never desert you. Man, he makes a big promise, right? But just a couple verses later from the text we read today, is the story where Peter disowns Jesus. <clears throat> where Jesus is off, captured by his friends, and some people go up to Peter and they say, hey, weren't you with that guy? Weren't you with Jesus? And Peter says, I don't know the guy. I want nothing to do with him. And I know that in Jesus' heart, he knew what was going to happen. I actually picture that Jesus, almost from a distance, can see Peter doing this. And when Peter turns his head and he notices that Jesus saw him deny him, that sinking feeling in his heart, That must be incredibly difficult. You know, I see a lot of things as a pastor, and I meet with a lot of people. The most painful thing that I tend to see isn't death, but divorce. It isn't death, but divorce. Whenever I see two people that have made a promise to one another that says, I will be with you for better or for worse in sickness and in health till death do us part, Whenever I hear two people make that promise, usually it's right here, I'm standing right here, and they're standing right here, I think to myself, God, please help them keep it. Because if they don't, there's going to be a lot of pain. Whenever you're tight with someone, and you're close, and the Bible says you're almost like one flesh, and it gets ripped apart, there is a sense of loneliness and isolation and pain that happens in a way that happens in no other way that I've ever seen. It's a painful thing. And here, Jesus was never married, but this is the closest he got. This was his best friend who had just promised he would never leave him. And the second after he promises, the promise is destroyed and broken, and Jesus finds himself lonely one more time. Do you see what's happening? He's getting lonelier and lonelier as he enters into the wilderness. Number four, right after he is betrayed by Peter, He finds himself surrounded by enemies and guards who are whipping him, who are spitting on him, and who are circling around him. Picture this, it's like they've got a blindfold on him, and he's sitting there hunched on the ground, and people are around him spitting on him and hitting on him. You know, one of the things that makes me more upset than anything is when I see bullies picking on a little kid. When I see bullies picking on a little kid. You know, you picture some little poor six-year-old surrounded by all these junior hires who are just kicking them and beating them, and they've got no defense possible. And here Jesus finds himself surrounded by these huge Roman soldiers, maybe twice the size of him, with all kinds of power, and Jesus has no friends left to protect himself. When he cries, uncle, no one hears his voice, and the pain just keeps coming. He finds himself in a very lonely place here where he is at the subject and terror of the people who want to destroy him, and he has no one who will intervene on his behalf. Not one Roman guard does it say in the text that, hey, let's give him a break. Instead, they just twist his arm even tighter and make the pain even worse. They put a crown of thorns on his head just to mock him and to make him feel embarrassed as blood comes down his forehead. Can you feel his loneliness starting to come? He's wondering to himself at this moment, who's going to help me? Is there anyone around? Anytime there's a cry of someone who doesn't know if there's anyone around to help them, Jesus knows that cry. Because he was once that kid beat up in a parking lot by people who didn't care a whit about him. 
Number five, Jesus comes then next before Pilate and Herod. And here, this is like a trial. So imagine you're over at the, um, you know, the courthouse and you are being tried and accusations are made against you. And this is what's fascinating. The accusations aren't true. And so there's a group of people that are sitting on one side. And imagine the most powerful people in the history of the world, Herod and Pilate. And they have a hundred attorneys with them. And then the Jews show up at that time and the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they come with all of their attorneys too. And so you have on one side of the courtroom like the hundred biggest oil companies on one side with all their powerful attorneys lined up in sharp black suits ready to like fight to the tooth and nail to destroy the person on the other side. And then Jesus sits over at his table and looks at his defense team and it's just him. He has no one to help him. He has no legal background. He doesn't have any attorneys on his side. And so Jesus finds himself in a trial before Herod and Pilate in one of the most important trials, if not the most important trial in the history of the world. And you have all the power on one side and Jesus completely alone in the other. He has no one to make his case for him. In Isaiah 53, it says this text about what would happen that day. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before its shearers is silent. He didn't even open his mouth. And so here you have a legal case being made against Jesus to say this guy's guilty and deserves death. And on the one hand, you've got all these powerful attorneys, and on his side, he's like a lamb being led to the slaughter, and he doesn't even open his mouth. What a lonely moment. Every year I try to take a spiritual retreat where I'm silent for at least a day or a couple days where I don't really say anything, and I'm just quiet to myself. Man, it's lonely. It's so lonely when you go to the, um, the store and everyone says hi and you just kind of nod and say hello. And you have no interaction or connection with anyone and no one's really engaging you. And Jesus found himself silent and alone before the court. Man, there's another snapshot of loneliness and rejection. Number six, the crowds start shouting to crucify him. So he loses the court in the legal way. But then he goes before another court, which is the court of public opinion. And there's this special moment where Jesus is standing on a stage next to another criminal. And they say, okay, look, Jesus, we're going to find him guilty, but let's let the crowds decide. And so what they do is they line up Jesus on one side and another criminal on the other, and they shout out to the crowds, who do you want us to kill, Jesus or this guy? And they all start shouting, Jesus. Man, this is brutal. For me, this is the equivalent of social media bullying. It's when everyone starts not really caring about the facts of the case or not really reading into any of the details. But you just get on Facebook and you start getting on Twitter and Instagram and you start tweeting all the things that you possibly can about how this guy deserves to die and no one even knows him or knows what he's going through. Man, I've seen terrible things in the news, especially with fake news, where people don't care about what's actually happening on the ground. You'll just bandwagon up and get all your friends together to destroy whoever you can. And that's exactly what happened in this case. So Jesus lost his court case, but then all the people of the world start ripping into him, saying this guy is worthless and deserves to die. So not only has he been through all these terrible things, but then here, right at the end, every single person in the city who just laid palms on the ground, the same ones who welcomed him into the city a week ago are the same ones in this very moment saying, kill the dude. We don't want him. And he loses that battle too. Man, can you feel him getting more and more alone in this moment? Number seven, he has to walk to a hill by himself. He has to carry a cross. And so after he's decided that he's guilty, Jesus has to carry this wood beam on his back that he's eventually going to be nailed to. And it's not a long walk. You know, it's about a mile or so. In fact, we have someone in our church here uh, who took that walk not very long ago, and I've taken it too. Um, the Via Dolorosa, it's a beautiful thing in its own way if you get to... Uh, ever go. But what Jesus does is he puts a piece of wood on his back and as people are lining the streets, they're spitting on him and cursing him and making fun of him. There are soldiers behind him whipping him. And Jesus in a very lonely way has to walk carrying this thing. And he's not thinking about anything else besides how am I going to take my next step. Eventually he falls and he can't get up and they make someone named si Simon carry his cross for him. But there's this lonely walk of shame that Jesus has to take all by himself where he has no help and no one to love him along the way. That must have been a lonely and terrifying moment, knowing where you're going to. I wonder if any of the disciples were watching as this happened. 
We don't know. But moment number eight, Jesus finds himself surrounded by mockers as he hangs. So as he's nailed to a cross and he's up there hanging from it, um, and this day he, he hung there for several hours. You don't die right away, but he was so weak at this point that he lasted less than most people. But even while he was hanging on the cross, there were some nasty things that happened to him that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. First thing that happens is there were two other people nailed next to him that he didn't know. So he's kind of forced up there with strangers. And one of the people who's dying next to Jesus actually starts mocking him and saying, hey, if you could save other people, why don't you save yourself? And then there were people that were walking by along the road that would just kind of point at him and laugh and said, this guy, this guy claimed to be the Messiah of the Jews and now he's going to die hanging on a piece of wood. And in Jesus' final moments where you would want like someone helping him, instead what ends up happening is the people walking by just mock him and make fun of him. Um, this is a little different, but one time I sat out here uh, during Ultra, and all the people walk by the church, right? And I sat out here in my little chair going, my daughter will never wear that. My daughter will never wear that. My daughter will never wear that. You know, and you just watch all these things, and it's kind of fun to play with it here and there. But this was very serious. The Lord of the universe is hanging on a tree, and instead of recognizing it for what it is and saying, God, my God, what's going on? Instead, people say, what an idiot. How alone must Jesus have felt at that moment where he's hanging and no one's there to care for him or to love him? Next, this is where the last two are heavy, number nine. Number nine is this very lonely moment Jesus has where he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He quotes Psalm 22 in that moment. You know, the one thing Jesus had more than anything else that got him through all the trials and ups and downs of his ministry was he knew every single day that him and the Father were one. What gave him his strength every morning when he woke up was knowing that the God of the universe was on his side, that his, the Father and the Son were tight and connected and no one could divide them. There was nothing that had the power to divide God in this world, and he believed that to his core. And yet here we have Jesus hanging on the cross believing that the Father and the Son were no longer connected. Man, another painful thing that I see in families is whenever a child and a parent are no longer in communion and connected to one another. It's a painful thing to watch. And here Jesus, who had had more deep connection with his Father than anyone in the history of the world, from all eternity, the Father and the Son in perfect unity and communion with one another, at this moment Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, the Apostles' Creed uses a phrase that we don't talk about enough, but it uses the phrase, he descended into hell, right? Have you ever, do you know what I'm talking about? He descended into hell. And a lot of people always ask, what does it mean that that's in the Apostles' Creed, and do we really believe that? Because how could Jesus ever go to hell? Well, it depends on how you define hell and how you understand these things, but one of the things that the Christian faith has always believed is that when Jesus was on the cross and he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was Jesus entering into hell because what's the, what's, what, what is heaven is a good question. The best definition of heaven isn't like margaritas on the beach, even though that's a pretty good thing, right? That's a pretty low version of what heaven should be. But the best definition of heaven is unity and connection to the God who made us and loves us. So what would hell then be? It would be the opposite of that. So what's the opposite of communion and per perfect relationship with God? Hell is complete separation from God. Hell is complete distance from the God who loves us and made us. And so here we see Jesus on the cross entering the loneliest moment of his life where the one to whom he was connected from the beginning of time is now separated from and he finds himself utterly alone. That's where he finds himself on the cross. So when we say he descended into hell, what that means is, it's not that Jesus went to some underworld where we don't know how things work. What we really mean is that in that moment, descending into hell means him and God were like this and were rendered asunder and apart. What a lonely place. What a difficult place to be. When we talk about our wildernesses, Jesus knows what this is too. Because the last one is this. What was the last thing that Jesus did where he entered into the wilderness? He died. In my opinion, death is the ultimate wilderness. And Jesus said at the last moments, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And one of the things that I, I think, and I think a lot of people think, is that Jesus could have fixed everything right before he died, right? Like he'd suffered a ton. He'd gone through everything. He'd been through hell. He'd been through all kinds of things. And, uh, you know, there was this hope, maybe right at the last second, where Jesus would say, just joking, I'm fine. I'm fine. 
I'm going to save everyone now. And it would have made so much sense because death is so much worse than everything else. You know, you would endure a million things in order to live if you knew you were just going to make it through the other side. One of the things that I think is interesting is the first painting that was ever painted of Jesus dead in the tomb didn't happen until very late, almost 1,600 years after it happened. For the first 1,600 years of the Christian faith, every painting of Jesus was after he'd been resurrected or some part of his ministry, but no one ever painted Jesus dead because that would be too terrifying. No one wants to think of the fact that for three days, Jesus' heart didn't beat. And his brain didn't function, and his body was wilting away. When we say Jesus entered into the wilderness, the greatest wilderness he ever entered into was death. You know, there's a lot of folks that you'll meet on their deathbed, maybe, maybe you don't, but I do, who are in their last moments. And it doesn't matter who you are, when you cross over to that other side or whatever it is, the reason why it's so fearful and scary is because you have no idea what's on the other side. That is terrifying. That's a wilderness if I've ever heard of it. And Jesus enters into the wilderness for our sake. So these are 10 little snippets or snapshots of Jesus' last moments. Can you get a sense of how lonely he was and how terrified he was? You know, I often think of Easter way more than I think of Good Friday. But if I had the power, I totally wouldn't have done it. Uh, Jesus' disciples all abandoned him. Why? It's probably because along the way they said, Jesus, if you really are the Son of God, you've got to stop this. I'm not going to follow you all the way to the end. This is ludicrous. This is nuts, and I don't want to be a part of it. But Jesus knew what he was doing, and he entered into the wilderness intentionally. One of the things that Jesus has a great line, he's with the garden when Judas is betraying him. His, his disciples say that they're going to take things into their own hands, and one of them grabs a sword and actually starts to fight the people so that Jesus won't be taken by them and cuts off someone in his ear. And Jesus has a great line. He says, look, guys. If I wanted to, in a moment, I could call down angels upon angels and armies upon armies to come and destroy any of my enemies at any given time. I can control the wind and the water. I can raise people from the dead. I can cure leprosy. I can turn two fish into feeding multitudes. I can do all these things. Why did Jesus choose, then, to enter into this wilderness and pain? Because he could have avoided it, and his disciples knew it. And they got furious at him because they said, why? Why would you choose to do this? Well, we know why. We know why. He did it for us. He did it for you and me. The verse that we cited at the beginning of the service, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he what? He gave. He chose to give himself for us so that when you and I find ourselves in the wilderness, we can know we're not alone. So that when you and I enter into death, we don't have to be afraid because there's one who's gone before us to lead us out of that dark place. It's almost like Jesus went into the wilderness to draw a map so that we could, when we get there, find it and say, ah, this is how I get out. And the way we get out of our wilderness every single time is by trusting in the God who's already been there and who's raised from the dead for our sakes. One of the essences of the Christian faith is the idea of substitution substitution. And this is how it works. It says this, is that you and I might deserve this, but instead Jesus takes that for us. He takes our place. He takes our place for us. So whenever we commit our sins or do or the things that we know we shouldn't do, the truth is, is that we deserve punishment. But Jesus chose to enter into punishment for us. He entered into the cross, he entered into loneliness, he entered into abandonment, he entered into depression, he entered into crying so hard that blood dripped from his pores. Not because he loved it, but because he loves us. The essence of the Christian faith is that we have a God who is willing and loves to suffer so that you and I can live. That's the good news of the Christian faith. Will you pray with me? God, we... Um, are humbled before a God who's willing to do so much when you and I are often willing to do so little. And so, Lord, we just pause now as we enter into Holy Week to reflect on what you were willing to do for the people that you love. And we thank you. We have something we could never ask for, and yet it's something we so desperately need. And so with humility and thanks, God, we say... Uh, 
You are our God, and we are thank you, thankful. Amen.